about 6 30 good evening welcome to the school board meeting if you would please and are able to please stand for the pledge of allegiance in a moment of silence i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands one nation under god indivisible with liberty and justice for all Thank you. I always love these for Charlie because these are the good things. We'd like to recognize uh, Charlie Schwank and the Riddle Running Club. Charlie, if you would, and I know the more family participated, and I don't and know. Kristen did participate, and most importantly, Janet Vance participated. Well, let's not talk yeah. about that. <laughs> but I just wanted to share that we had a phenomenal time down at um, the 5K in Indianapolis, and to see two buses depart at, did we really leave at four in the morning? Was that right? <laughs> at four in the morning with those buses loaded, and the most, the, the best thing was, she is, first of all, is the only person who can talk me into not only getting up at four in the morning, but actually trying to do a 5K at four in the morning. But you, we had, um, and I wish she could have been here, I had this little girl come up to me and hold my hand, and she said, where are you gonna be in the group? And I said, at the very, very end, and she said, you can do this. And I think that that was shared, but it was just that, in all seriousness, it was that mentality that well, you can do this, that we're gonna get through this. And then to see Charlie at the end, and she had been there for a while by the time I got there, to <laughs> congratulate everybody and to give hugs and, and to give that word of encouragement and to know that that is building our programs, our cross country and our track programs at the middle school and at the high school. And Charlie, if you'll share other things that you were engaged in with the running club, I know it goes much further than just the 5K, but you've got things coming up this Friday. And mm -hmm. so would you mind sharing just a little bit about what you're doing at Riddle? Do you want to stand? Sure, okay. sure. Well, we have 114 students in grades three, four, and five who participate twice a week. And they, they just come to run. And they say, well, Lord, what are we gonna do? And I go, well, we're probably gonna run tonight. And they go, okay, that sounds like what we wanna do. And they're so enthusiastic and I think it, the, the amount of parent support that we had this year, we had 45 parents who en enjoyed their four o'clock trip with us in the morning and to have them finish with their kids. We had a grandma who finished with her grandson. And to, to think that we're building that kind of relationship and that idea that yes, everybody can do it and I can keep doing it. Mm -hmm. I don't have to stop when I'm 60 or 70. <laughs> or even 80, I don't have to stop, I can keep on going. And these kids are getting the idea that they can go farther now. They thought one lap around the blacktop was gonna be a big trip, but now they're doing eight laps around the blacktop without even complaining. Yeah. And to think that we're, we're just planting that little seed, if we just get a few of them to keep on doing it and keep that healthy lifestyle, I think that we will have accomplished a goal that we did, started with kids who graduated last year. So we've been doing it a long time and I wouldn't, I don't think I'd do anything else with my time after school. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and I've told everybody, if I'd known there were cookies at the end of the race, I probably would have cut a little more time <laughs> off. But <laughs> seriously, thank you, because it was a really <coughs> unique experience and just to be surrounded by that support and to know that you can do it and to hear the kids reiterate that is what it's all about. And, and the good news is, I've already signed up for next year already. <laughs> so I that was not. the first thing they wanted to do was, are we going to do it again? And every one of the students raised their hand and said, I want to go back. Even our fifth graders, I told them if they have a sibling in third or fourth grade or coming into third grade next year, I said, you are welcome to come back with us as long as that sibling is in running club. And so I have several who want to keep on coming. And I have such wonderful parents who come. Jenny and Brody have done it two years now with their kids, and I think I, I might have hoped them. They might come back next year, even though Peyton won't be there anymore. But we'll let Peyton come back if Mom and Dad do it. Is that okay? You too, Molly. Thank you so much for your work on that. That was really a neat event. 
Elizabeth ran it too. Now the Weaver boys are like their father; they don't run. But uh, <laughs> we might sign Lane up for it. But well done, Shirley, and thank, thank you from behalf of the board. I, I hear great things about it. Thank you. With that, we'll move to consent items. Uh, meeting minutes of the April 17, 2017 regular board meeting. Are there any additions or deletions or comments? <clears throat> Said we want to do these all together, should we do them separately? Uh, minutes of the May 3rd, 2017 study session. Any additions, comments, deletions? And minutes of the May 3rd, 2017 special board meeting. Are there any additions, deletions, or comments? In that case, is there a motion to approve the consent items as given? Motion to approve consent. A second. Yeah. Motion made by Tom. The second was by Sandy. No. Nope. Or Jenny. I'm sorry, Jenny. Motion by Tom. Second by Jenny. All in favor of approving the consent items, raise your right hand. Motion carries six to zero. On to the financial report. So tonight um, we have claims docket eleven thousand two sixty nine to eleven thousand four forty totals one million five hundred and fifty seven thousand one hundred and forty five dollars and ninety nine cents. We have a few payrolls as well. We've got the April 28th payroll that totaled $415,832.56, and the May 12th payroll that totaled $432,308.05. And then we also have our funds reports um, going through the funds that we operate from primarily. We've got the general fund that started with $486,908.35, had $1,018,770.69 worth of receipts. Expenditures for, for the month were $888,138.70, leaving an ending balance of $617,540.34. Any questions on general fund? <coughs> All right, moving on to debt service, we started with $1,870,860.36. We had receipts that totaled $9,522.80 through property tax revenue credits. Um, and then we did not have any expenditures, but watch out for June because uh, coming up in June next month is when we pay our debt service amounts, um, so that'll be next month. So we had an ending balance of $1,880,383.16 for debt service. Capital Projects Fund had a starting balance of $475,022.77, $4,447.67 worth of receipts. Expenditures for the month totaled $184,937.32 leaving us an ending balance of $294,533.12. And we get funds again for um, debt service, capital projects, transportation and bus replacement. We get those funds twice a year, so that'll be June and December that we get more tax levies from there. Did you have a question? Sure. <clears throat> so it looked like we spent about 200000 in capital projects. Is there a reason or wouldn't it work to take that money from bond money since we have the bond projects or we went to capital projects for certain items those items um, that are that have come out of capital projects some of that is for ongoing um, repairs and maintenance throughout the district the bond funds that we use um, or I should say um, the debt service is to repay our current outstanding bonds and then the bond funds that we have now um, the 2015 bonds that we're using for the high school and the middle school and the Columbia projects those are dedicated for those HVAC improvements uh, when we when we issued the bonds in 2015, we told those shareholders, this is what we're going to spend these funds for is this HVAC project. So if we were to mitigate and go and circumvent around um, the process and do other things for it, that would not be very fiduciously responsible. Thank you. You're welcome. Val, so part of this difference is, and you have a note there, right, that we paid the last Apple We did. Payment. We did. So when is the next Apple Next Amen. Apple, um, the first one that we started with, we're going to, instead of a biannual um, lease payment, we were able to secure a lower interest rate on this new round. 
by, by transitioning to a once a year payment. And that first one will start in June, and then it'll be every June for four years. Okay, so there will be another hit next. There will be next month, but then it well, will. Well, and we have tax revenues to help offset okay. that that cost as well. Plus, we're selling our uh, previously used devices as well. So, lots of options. Thank you. You're welcome. On to transportation funds started with nine hundred and forty nine thousand six hundred and thirty eight dollars and twenty seven cents. We had $2,240.66 worth of receipts. That comes from local property taxes. Um, Month-to-date expenses were $44,487.48, leaving us an ending balance of $907,391.45. Any questions for transportation? All right, moving on to bus replacement last but not least. So this is the fund that we can utilize to um, obtain new buses. We started with $239,795.96. We had $610.62 worth of receipts. No expenditures because we haven't purchased our buses yet, um, leaving us an ending cash balance of $240,406.58. Any questions on the fund report this afternoon? Good evening, I should say. That's all I have. I had a question on the payroll. Mm -hmm. what, uh, I think it was the first one. Were there stipends paid in that one? There's um, some of the coaching stipends are paid out. Some of the um, athletic and academic ECA payrolls are on an ongoing basis as those are um, as a, that work is done for those. Any further questions for Bob? In that case, is there a motion to approve the <coughs> claims 11269 to 11440, the payroll and the funds report? So moved. Motion made by Sandy. Second that. Second by Steve. All in favor of approving those, please raise your right hand. Motion carries six to zero. Uh, moving on to the student stakeholder focus. Then we have these donations. Are there any other additions before I start? For just these three, do three donations? I always look to candy, but I believe that those are all That's that it. we have. Yeah. And before I start on those, last last meeting, we thanked RCC so much for their coverage of us, and we really do appreciate it. I also was remiss in not thanking the Sentinel, and I know Christina's not here, but I want to tell her thank you for the positive uh, support we receive and having the uh, Rochester Sentinel in our meeting. So while she's not here, I wanted to say thank you on that. I <laughs> <laughs> guess I could have timed that better, couldn't I? She, she can watch it on RTC4 now. <laughs> RTC4. But also, also along that, WROI does a yes. wonderful job of allowing us that weekly report that we do get a lot of comments and feedback. So we're in a community that has a lot of media support and that helps with the marketing and getting the message out. And so when we do um, state level things, that is something that is rare and the other boards talk about that they are surprised so thank you to rtc tv4 wroi and the rochester Sentinel. Mm -hmm. and they'll have to watch it on t rtc4 now did you have did you have anything no i, I i'm with the sentinel oh, okay <laughs> she's usually right there i couldn't see you back there so thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> on that note uh, we always say the thank you, but uh, we're going to ask for approval on these donations. Anonymously, one student's beef and boards field trip for $40. Country Lanes free bowling for all first and second grade PE classes. And the Fulton County Solid Waste District to RMS for $500. Is there a motion to approve those donations as given? So moved. Movement moved by Jenny. Second. Second by Tom. All in favor of approving the donation as given, please raise your right hand. Motion carries six to zero. Thank you very much again for your donors. I know I say that every week or every month, but it uh, truly is important. And we sincerely do appreciate it. On to overnight field trips. Adam, would you like to share in regards to either of the field trips? We have the state FFA convention, and I know that that's an annual opportunity where they can address public communications, their projects, those types of things. And then the other is a cross country field trip both Alan Sager and Scott Stahlbaum. Um, typically, I believe that they have taken six overnight field trips, allows them the chance to run different courses, build teamwork, uh, just spend the time together, and we've had those without incident as well. Adam, I don't know if you have any additional information. 
<laughs> Guess that's a no. <laughs> okay, then. Is there a motion to approve the overnight field trips as given? So moved. Movement, first motion made by Steve. Second. Second by Jenny. All in favor of approving overnight field trips, raise your right hand. Motion carries six to zero. Information and analysis, bylaw 100. Okay, bylaw 100 is at, this, these are third readings. So after I read these, I would um, ask Brad to entertain a motion to adopt them. Mm -hmm. The bylaw 100 is adding language to include school psychologists under the definition of a teacher. The other policies that we have, and they have been available on our website, on the front page of our website, if anyone has any questions or would like to look those over. Those are policies 1411, 3211, and 4211. They add language for the protection of whistleblowers, and it is a different way to report in case it's someone who feels like the superintendent is the one that needs to be reported and the board at the same time. Um, 2221 uh, clarifies the mandatory curriculum schools must teach and the role that the superintendent may play or must play. 3120.06 is that for a student teacher to be placed under a supervisory teacher, that supervisory teacher must have an evaluation rating of effective or highly effective. 3140 and 3141 separate resignation and termination language into two separate policies. 3142 incorporates state law which provides that boards can vote to terminate once they have complied with and followed due process. 3220 has been redefined to match Indiana code around teacher and staff evaluations. 5320 changes the wording to allow for parents to select a nurse practitioner or a county health nurse to provide immunizations. Previously it said that a doctor, but this is understanding the reality of our healthcare field. It also adds immunizations for meningitis as required. 7310 gives local control as to how to, how to dispose of textbooks. 8455 <coughs> defines concussion training, another tweak to that that we've been working on. Um, 8500 provides the school provide, provi says that we must provide breakfast for students, which we do. And 8600, which aligns Indiana code that states public schools will provide the needed transportation for students who live in the district but elect to attend a private or charter school as long as we are running that route, we must pick them up and do that. And these are all policies that um, have required little discussion or debate because they're basically complying with law, which we must do. Any comments or questions of Jenny? Is there a motion for to approve by law 100 in the third reading of those policies? Uh, Stacy made the motion. Uh, Sandy seconded. All in favor of approving those, please raise your right hand. Motion carries six to zero. Math textbook adoption. Well, just as Jenny was talking about um, disposal of textbooks, we'll be adopting textbooks this evening, hopefully. As you recall, last year um, was the math textbook adoption for the district. There was some transition going on with administration at Columbia, and so Mr. Snyder contacted me and wanted to make sure that they were in alignment and that he had a chance to work with teachers in regards to that, and at that time we agreed that we would look at his math textbook adoption for this year, even though we're a bit off cycle. So. And um, if you want to scroll down to our next one, uh, we obviously began this process last year. Um, I've got two ladies here that um, have been uh, involved in this from the very beginning, uh, Kim Beal and Alyssa Ramsey. Um, Kim is in first grade, Alyssa's in second grade. And um, the, the bottom line was at the end of the year last year, we did not have a comfortable um, number one uh, program that we felt met the needs of our students. So uh, that's why we put it off for another year. And, and part of the, the mention of that is that uh, these ladies and the ladies uh, listed up there also uh, were a part of this. Um, again, taking two years, they didn't sign up for it for two years. They, were, they only wanted to do it once in uh, one year, and I, I had them do it twice. And, and I'm very grateful for that because I felt like it was very thorough. Uh, you can see that we researched or piloted and piloted um, numerous uh, different textbooks. If you'll go ahead and go down to the next slide. Um, we uh, are recommending uh, that um, we adopt the Ready, I Ready Math and go down to the next slide. Uh, the, the basic uh, program is, involves three different 
portions, uh, a diagnostic portion, uh, an instructional portion, and a online instructional portion. Uh, the diagnostic piece is uh, very important to us in that uh, it gives us the data to drive our instruction, and uh, we feel like we're lacking that at this point. Um, we, do, we do gather data in our math, and the teachers do a fantastic job, but this program aligns um, and tells uh, the teachers exactly uh, where every student is and uh, what they're ready for. Um, our teachers teach in a lot of uh, groups and stations. Uh, many traditional math programs uh, are, are more classroom focused where every student is getting the same instruction. Um, we, we believe that uh, just like in our reading program where we're having tremendous success uh, at our level, uh, that our math program needs to be in line with that. So we, we want to build our math program to look a lot like our, our, um, our reading program and focus on the students' needs um, versus just the whole classroom need. By getting these other two portions, the, uh, the diagnostic piece and the online piece, that gives our teachers the flexibility uh, to model the math program to look a lot like our stations and our groups that we do in our reading program. I'm going to go down to the next slide. Uh, each one of these, um, it, it's a bundle, per, uh, bundle package, the diagnostic, the um, personalized um, e-learning piece and the, um, the classroom instruction are all uh, bundled into one package. You can purchase them separately, uh, however, uh, if you purchase the entire program uh, as presented tonight, um, it ends up being um, a, a lot cheaper uh, for us and, uh, and, and for our corporation. I'm not going to go through every one of those, um, but that's just some data and some information about each each part of it. Do you guys have anything you want to say on that slide there specifically? On that one. Yeah, I figured the down. next two you guys are, are on for uh, sharing some of that. Well, the next one just kind of goes over. Um, this is just straight from the iReady um, Ready website. It just kind of gives gives you some um, more details about each one. But if you go to the next one, that's probably the one that I'm most excited about because. These are actual um, scores and data from my specific class this year. Um, we had the uh, iReady representative come in. We gave um, Alyssa's class and my class the diagnostic at the middle of the year. And what we found is I have the high ability cluster in first grade. Our scores were not near as where we thought they should be. Um, we weren't showing anybody ahead of middle of the year first grade. So it was very shocking for us. But then after um, we, we did the iReady program for the next three weeks, um, they say eight minutes a day is basically kind of what you aim for. Um, and we started to see tremendous growth. Um, you can see kind of right there just a snapshot of, you know, most students are in green and then we've got some yellow. No one was um, in red after we, after we kept working. And you want to clarify that? No, eight minutes a day um, would be, well, what he was saying, our math, we like to do stations. So we have uh, three to four, I know second grade does four, we do three stations where the teacher is one station and we differentiate so we have small groups where we're meeting them at their level. And then we have an iPad station and that's really where we've been lacking is we've been looking for that perfect digital tool that will meet them where they're at and this is what does that so you know one station they could be working at their own pace if they are in first grade but they're at a third grade level great there are those kids that are still working at kindergarten levels and that's great because it meets them where they're at and then we've got you know some other desk stations um, as well Thanks. <laughs> We're not going to just teach math right now. So right. Sure we're, not, we're not proposing that. Do I'm ready. To, do you want to give the, uh, the next slide, please? Oh, this just shows you that this is um, an individual student. And so the very um, left part is where they started at middle of the year and then where they ended. This is literally three weeks of work. So they started at the beginning of the blue line and they ended um, at, the, at the right side of the blue line in just three weeks time. We saw growth and what we really like about it is it's so interactive and it's not like the same old boring practice. There's characters and they were excited to do it every single day. Are we gonna do I ready? And then when our pilot ended, <clears throat> they were all bummed. <laughs> So for uh, 
for our recommendation, uh, we would like to um, adopt iReady for next year. Uh, we feel those reasons there are um, several of the reasons. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that after two years of looking, we feel like this is what best for is best for our students. Um, one of the advantages that we have had by, by waiting a year um, is that um, there were several schools in the area. Tippy Valley is uh, one example that uh, you ladies actually met with uh, their administration and teachers. Uh, they had a year worth of uh, work uh, and, and using this program, and um, we got a lot of really good feedback from them. Uh, and we also, uh, during this entire process, I mean, spoke with other schools about what they had adopted um, and you know, issues and concerns that they had had after a year as well. And uh, that's, that's our recommendation. If you guys have any questions, we'd be happy to try to field them. So are these actual textbooks or is this all digital? Uh, go ahead. It's both. There's a book part and then the iPad part. The instructional, the, the three uh, phases that I showed you, the instructional piece the, uh, is the textbook piece, the assessment piece is the assessment that we give three times and, and take that data, and then the um, iReady piece is the iPad uh, digital piece. So there, there are textbooks as well. So if I'm envisioning this correctly, you teach the skill whole class and then break into four math stations and move around and iReady will be a component mm -hmm. of one station. Right. Okay. And it's fit to that specific child. It okay. fills all their gaps. So this doesn't necessarily come with manipulatives or anything else. You would use right. your own and fill that in in the other mm -hmm. three. And one of the advantages, I'm glad you mentioned the, the manipulative piece, is that over the course of the last, um, I don't know how many, eight, eight years probably that you guys have been using what you're using, uh, they have uh, accumulated a lot of uh, manipulative, manipulatives and additional uh, uh, equipment and things to, to be able to do this without, we don't feel like, like a, a need to necessarily go out and buy a bunch of stuff, which sometimes you have to do. I, I think we're in pretty good shape, and I think these ladies and, and the teams would agree that, that we've got what we need to implement this without any, any more additional costs. And K through 2? No, one through Just two. Just one through two, okay. Kindergarten uh, is uh, opting to not uh, adopt anything at this time. They have uh, developed their curriculum based on their standards uh, and with the kids that are coming in and the needs that they have, they feel like the program that they've got is, uh, is sufficient and that they don't need to spend the extra money to, uh, to do that. So, and, you know, the, I mean, we, we are trying to be fiscally responsible in terms of um, you know the iPads. Uh, they have, they have like um, station. I mean iPads. They, they're they're not one to one in kindergarten anyways. Mm -hmm. So you know spending the additional money on some of that stuff is uh, they they didn't feel like they needed uh, that at this time. So they, they were they were given the opportunity to make it really great, but they, they they feel very comfortable with what what they've got. And I appreciate that fiduciary responsibility too, and waiting a little bit to decide what was the best fit and best for students and best for your staff instead of rushing to do something. I will tell you that when we went to the textbook caravan last year, this was our first pri this was our first fit. And then we went to talk to them and we were like, oh, it's kind of, you know, I don't know. And so it was just nice to have that year and talk to you know, Akron and Goshen. And those teachers were excited about it. And that's kind of what helped get us a little bit more excited. How does the cost compare to what we had had before uh, the it's a little more expensive it's, it's about $32 per student however with the diagnostic piece um, we are looking to use the formative assessment grant that we've got to cover that third of it um, on the I portion of it the internet or the the online portion we're looking to um, uh, reduce some of the subscriptions in some of our current programs that we've got we aren't getting the use out of, maybe not getting the monetary gain out of that uh, we currently have to cover that third of it. So um, I'm going to throw this number out. We'll, we'll nail it down more uh, because we don't know the uh, formative assessment piece, how much that will actually work out. But um, we're figuring about a nine, nine to ten dollar per student, um, maybe up to twelve ish for um, textbook addition. Is that total over the cost of? 
six years, or is that per year? That's every every year. Okay. They get a new they get a new textbook. You asked about the textbooks. They get every student gets a new textbook. And updated, and the teacher textbooks if they ever update standards, because um, they recently just made the Indiana standards back from the Common Core. Teachers will get a new teacher guide every year. And the students also. And students also. Get, get that, yep, every year. Get that textbook. Has second grade had an opportunity to meet with third grade to see how this will transition yet? We we met last, or no, we met. Uh, I don't know how long ago it was to to discuss about. You know the program that they were using because we were still looking, mm -hmm. um, and based on the feedback that we received, we didn't really feel that that was the best direction for us to go. Uh, we are actually meeting tomorrow at 1500 uh, to. Uh, at three o'clock, all you civilians. <laughs> to, uh, to do a, uh, a handoff of our second graders to our third grade team um, to include a, a, a data dump, if you want to call it that, but to provide them uh, with as much information about those students as we possibly can. And to also align, talk about the alignment of our curriculum, uh, and I don't, I don't know that that's something that's happened um, enough, and, and we're, we're uh, making sure that we're getting, having those communications uh, with, our, with our counterparts at the middle. So that will take place again tomorrow. That is fabulous. That's something that we've needed for a while, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you for your consideration. Thanks, lady. Is there a motion for the math textbook adoption? So moved. Moved by Sandy. Yep. Second. Second by Tom. All in favor of approving the Columbia math book adoption if signified by raising your right hand, please. Motion carries six to zero. And on to science. I think we'll start with Riddle and Luke on science. It is the science adoption year, and I believe that our choices were very, very limited. It came down really to maybe two products. We uh, took a look at three. I'm not going to wow you with a slideshow like Columbia, <laughs> but I will try with my verbal articulation here. Uh, we attended, uh, our, our science teachers attended a caravan in, in January over at Plymouth where all the textbook providers were there. They narrowed it down to three. McGraw Hill, Pearson, and then also the Purdue Science Initiative, which is kind of a fairly new product out there that had uh, like STEM kits and things like that to where the curriculum was, was based around that. Then uh, meeting with the committee with our science teachers and uh, Mrs. Smith, we narrowed it down to two Pearson and the Purdue Science Kits and then got it down, uh, down to Pearson finally because they also had the science kits but also met the what our teachers were looking for as far as the curriculum and the, the reading content, it had that as well. So Pearson offers the digital package, our textbooks, as well as the science kits, which offer uh, group work and the, the STEM activities that a lot of our teachers are already doing in their classrooms with their own materials, but it'll build it around the particular units in the science as well. I'm gonna pass it off to Mrs. Murphy here briefly if she wants to add anything. Yeah. Um, yeah, like you said, um, we can pull it into our reading much easier than what we're using now. Um, it's really well aligned to the standards, um, which is really important in fourth grade because we test um, science. Um, the kit, um, the experiments are actually meaningful. They really go along with what you're teaching. Um, the assessments. Um, are a lot better than what we have been using. So overall, we just really liked it a lot. The thing that about our assessments, um, the assessments seem to test more standards, um, but won't take as much time for us to test, which we do a lot of testing, so that would be very familiar with the kids. Um, the textbook itself is a workbook and a textbook in one. Um, and it's very friendly to them, so we were excited about that. Um, oh, the reading portion, too. Is the, uh, there's so many days where some of the classrooms, if, if something gets pushed aside, it's not yet. And so 
um, it's really hard for us to see that happen. So this um, program is very friendly to move in or push into reading and community several class Any questions? Did you collaborate with middle school, or did they? Go, did you guys work together on the science curriculum as far as how they integrate, or no? Didn't collaborate in that way. Talked to Mr. Hawes about what middle school adopted. We didn't adopt the same textbook series that they did. Are the kits replenished each year? Yes, uh, we talked about it because the textbook that they said is actually a consumable. I think we do that with one of our other textbooks. I know math has yes, that as well. The middle school of math, and so without cost, that is replenished every year. So that quote that you see there is with the new textbook that students will get every year. And then the decision would, was made for each student to have one then. You're not going to share that. Correct. Yep. Each student will have their own textbook. And how does that compare to that one, Luke, to our previous science? The, I don't know about our previous science cost. Doing the quick math here, it looks like it's about between $18, $19 a student per year over six years. Okay. Is that about that? It is. Okay. So we're about the same thing. And we are working on textbook rental fees. We want to bring those to you in early June, but it was difficult to do that without the approval of the board for textbooks. So everything that we're bringing to you would be very close in alignment to what we've had in the past, knowing that we're trying to, um, as Jason said, look at programs, look at those um, apps and stuff to try to not duplicate and, and to take those costs down and to use the assessment grants and those types of things. So we're every number we're bringing to you is well within what we've done in the past. It was just hard to bring that in conjunction with the adoption process as well until we had your approval on that. But nothing you're seeing would be unreasonable or out of the norm from past cost. I don't have to ask that question again. Yeah. <laughs> do we want to do middle school together? Or would you care rather keep them separate? However, however you'd like. Would you, would you like, would you guys like to separate out middle school from grade school, or we want Misty to present, or would we just move forward? Let's just move forward unless there's any objection.
that you've been talking a lot about lately. Um, we have something called Learn Smart that really put McGraw Hill over the top. Um, how many of you are familiar with um, Excel? Excel math. Yeah, how many of you are familiar with that? Okay. <laughs> this is um, Learn Smart is very similar to that, other than um, it does if a child misses a question, it doesn't set them back. Thank you. Crazy. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> it actually levels the kids out if the kids answer certain questions about science. It will level them out, but it doesn't tell them. Um, the data tracking is unbelievable. I was doing cartwheels over that. I was doing the old data tracking where I pre-tested everything and went through and marked how many times a kid would miss number one, number two, and I would use that to uh, drive my instruction. This is all done for me, and it also gives the student instant feedback. Students can set their own personal goals by looking at the data from their pre-test, their formative assessments. They can see for themselves what they're doing well, what they need to work on, and then they can set goals within the, within McGraw Hill and and see how they progress as well. Um, that was about it. Oh, it does provide I, uh, provide ISTEP material. Um, some of the things that I used, I did pull some of the lesson plans out of this curriculum to use with my my class that I have right now, and they were like, "Wow, this is this is hard. I don't I don't know if I could do this." And I said, "The word is not hard. It's called rigorous." And we're going to use it. <laughs> um, it provided a lot of rigor in my classroom. I really loved it. It pushed the kids thinking. It uh, provided a lot of opportunities for conversation, uh, collaboration, creativity. Um, I, we, we love it. And I had, um, I made Mrs. Weaver sitting on the board. <laughs> and she, she was impressed with it as well. We had parents. We had staff members. Um, it, it was a great collaborative time. Misty, just to make sure that I understood you correctly, there's virtual labs and hands-on labs? Correct. Okay, so there's both. And the, uh, the price is going to be about $20 per student for uh, the next six years, and that includes everything. Everything. There's nothing extra that we really need to buy. What did you just say? I'm sorry. <laughs> he didn't hear me say that. <laughs> no, but what did you say on the number? It's about twenty dollars per student for yeah. the next six years. Well, it's thirteen for the textbook and six for consumables. In comparison, last year our seventh grade was fourteen for the textbook and fifteen for consumables. So it's actually ten dollars to help cheapen our textbook cost at the middle school. <coughs> Not cheapen, less expensive. Rigorous. <laughs> And this lines up with what Riddle is doing and what the high school is doing? I've actually worked with Pearson before um, at another school corporation. Pearson <coughs> does have good, um, good curriculum. It does, in my opinion, McGraw-Hill uh, pushes at this level, at the middle school level, pushes the thinking a little deeper. And again, I spoke with the high school teachers looking to see what they were looking for, how we could kind of mirror um, and gel our curriculum with theirs. And we're a little apples and oranges because Riddle is not, I mean, what portion of the day and then portion of the year are you able to teach science where Mrs. Kripe has right. every day for right. a full class period. So, so we just want something that flows, you know, that prepares them for the next, the next building. That's true, but that's less of an issue yeah, with so. this than in maybe some other. And again, I've worked with the Pearson curriculum, and in my opinion, I think that it will gel nicely. Mm -hmm. In the Pearson, there is journal entry, there's collaborative skills, there's 21st century skills. They do have some online opportunities with Pearson, which goes along with McGraw Hill. So when those fifth grade kids come in as sixth graders, it's not like a, a shock to them. Right. They will have a lot of background knowledge with the technology in the virtual labs and the journal entries that they'll be able to adapt to that quite quickly. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And do we have a high school? 
We do. And before we do that, is there any objection, including the high school and with the Riddle and middle school? And we'll just do them together. Um, at the high school, we were not able to get all of our content, our science content areas through one company uh, because we we're offering some uh, different elective level sciences uh, next year. So we have about half of our uh, techs coming from McGraw Hill and about half coming from Pearson. Uh, we went with both of those. Uh, with Biology 1, uh, we were really happy with the textbook that we had. Um, so instead of purchasing new books, uh, what we're going to purchase is the e-edition, e so every student can have an uh, e-edition. And we are getting a classroom set of textbooks uh, that utilize the same vocabulary and content, but it's at a textile <coughs> level for our students uh, that have struggled in biology. We feel sometimes that's because the text is too hard, not because they can't uh, understand the content. So we, um, that's what our biology uh, will be. Um, that's through Pearson. Also through Pearson, we're getting environmental science, AP chemistry, and our uh, health textbooks. Through McGraw-Hill, we'll be getting our integrated chemistry and physics, chemistry one, physics, uh, earth and space science, and AP zoology textbooks. Um, all of those, we're getting a classroom set of textbooks and e-editions for all students uh, to help minimize the cost transfer to our students. So our um, cost range uh, from $13 up to uh, $20 in our normal level classes and then our AP level classes will be $29 and that's because they're utilizing an AP level textbook uh, which are more expensive to purchase. Um, is, is the biology the only class that had the ability to have a class set with a lower lexile level? Correct. Yes, that's correct. Any other questions for Mr. Strasser? Mm -hmm. Is there a motion? To approve the science textbooks adoption for Riddle Middle and the High School. So moved. Moved by Sandy. I second that. Second by Steve. All in favor of approving the science textbook adoption for those three schools signify by raising your right hand. <coughs> Motion carries six to zero. Thank you, teachers, administrators. Thank you guys for putting in the time. Sincerely, I know it's long and Mrs. Weaver did tell me. So, and I know the time it takes, but we really do appreciate it and thank you very much. And I know you're all nervous about this, but you shouldn't be. Y'all did a good job. On to no, student. They may want I'm sorry. No, they may want your phone. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. By all means, if you would like to leave, please feel free to do so. You're not going to offend They're all anyone. Looking at me I, especially the little ones. Brody's over there like, hey, we got to go. <laughs> Thank you. On to student technology handbook policies device repair form. There are just a few um, changes that Scott has um, to share with you and talk to you about in regards to uh, the device, the repair form, and the handbook in regards to the new adoption of the iPads that we just went through and the fact that the cost repair MacBooks is going down since they are older. I'll tell you what, I'm going to get my exercise. I can go with Shirley to the Mini K next year. We'll <laughs> sign you up. Yeah. <laughs> so. it, he's on video now. He's on video. Here are the new costs for repair and uh, the cost that we, when we send them in uh, for repairs. Uh, the cost for pretty much everything. Um, we used to have like one, two, three, four, five, six different on our old uh, form because we had iPad 2s, iPad 3s, iPad 4s, Airs, but now we just have one iPad, the new iPad 5, since we're going to be updating. And these are the updated costs um, for repair, for, for like the screens and everything. Um, I'm trying to think. The screens are, stay about the, uh, they bumped up to from 65 to 97, obviously because of brand new. Um, 
cases, they were $44. The case for these are now $80. Um, chargers went from uh, $9 to $15. Cables, uh, the charging cables were went from almost $6 to $10. Um, but we're going to try to utilize a lot of these older ones that we had, so um, that should keep some of the costs down for some of these kids that um, will have, like, we should have a bunch of spares left. Um, and for, like, the middle school, uh, they'll have keyboards, so that's why keyboard was added. Um, and we're getting a set for actually middle school, too. Um, then there's a cover, a, a flip cover on these new ones, so those are about $15. Um, the cost for your MacBooks, um, they came down, the screens are still the same. Um, the, some of the other prices, like chargers, they came down from like $40 to $30. Um, and actually the, the replacement used to be about $850, down to $320 now. Mm -hmm. like a, it was totally ran over or something. So these are the updated costs for this next coming year. I had a question about wording. Um, it's actually in this section. Mm -hmm. We have in section 7.3, um, it says uh, about the third sentence in, if the device is lost, stolen, or totally damaged as a result of irresponsible behavior, the parent or student may be responsible for the full replacement cost. And then in 7.5, it says a student or guardian will be responsible for costs due to damage or loss. So I would respectfully ask that we make them both may. Yeah, absolutely. We do try to give administration the opportunity to look into and investigate those incidents if they happen. So absolutely. Any more comments or questions for Mr. Kissler? In that case, is there a motion to adopt the Student Te Technology Handbook Policies Device Repair Form with the addendum Jenny had, changing those to may instead of must? So moved. Moved or by? Uh, changing it from will to, to may. To may. Very well. And that's your, you did make, you did make a motion to, yes. motion by Jenny? Second. Second by Sandy. All in favor of approving the technology handbook policies with those changes were signified by raising your right hand. Motion carries 6-0. The riddle traffic flow pattern. We have had um, concerns brought to us when we talk about being good neighbors and, and working with those around us. Riddle <coughs> has had a tremendous uh, backflow of traffic both in the morning and in the afternoon time at dismissal. In fact, we've had incidents, and Skeeter, correct me if I'm wrong, but we've had incidents where um, ambulances weren't able to get to homes because the road was so blocked, and that happened to be at dismissal time, and that was a concern getting to that home. Um, we've also had other emergencies as they're trying to get through or people getting locked into the traffic and not being able to back out and get out to appointments and things that they need. So I've asked... Um, uh, Skeeter to look at this and to work with Luke in regards to it. Don came on late. We were working as much as we could with transportation and so I know Skeeter's had a lot of conversations with Ken Long about a way to help open up that traffic flow, try to provide a little more safety in regards to what Charlie tries to do out there on that road and the dismissal of those students. So Skeeter, if you could walk everybody through some of your proposed changes to help with the traffic flow to open that road up before and after school. The green arrows are the, is Markman Avenue or Markman Drive that runs in front of the school. We, what we'd like to do is next year is we shut that down in the morning for a period of time to let the buses come in off of 3rd Street and get in front of the school and kind of park at an angle to unload their students and also do this and run the parents around the back side of the school, the north side of the school, and come around to the south side of the school at the fifth grade door to unload uh, the students, the car students at that time. And in the afternoon, same thing, that street would be shut off for a period of time, four or five buses in at a time, pick up their students and they, and they shoot out. Parents would come in from the uh, north side, go around the west side of it and end up at the fifth grade door and pick up their students in the afternoons also. Um, right out the fifth grade door, 
we're going to remove three of the parking lots and put the handicapped bus right there so those kids can route that door right onto the bus and exit that way. That's the plan. We, I mean, Charlene's always running down Third Street trying to get numbers and stuff like that. We're hoping to double line parent pickup behind the school and come in there and pick up, get a double line and get them flowing. They'll keep the gate closed until 2.30. The, the north gate, the northwest gate will be closed until 2.30. Then parents can come on in and start picking up and start lining up there at the fifth grade door to retrieve their students. And you say two lines? Two lines, so if we can get three, we'll try it. Hopefully eliminate that line from Barkman down to Fulton Avenue. Or, well, we're hoping to eliminate the line from, yeah, Fulton clear back to the back side of the school there, the north, northwest side of the school. Hopefully we can get more in that flow of traffic in behind the school. It is becoming just really concerning. We're getting phone calls. Parents are lining up. The loop parking is on rolling as early as 2, 10 after 2 mm -hmm. sometimes, and, and just blocking those roads, and it's making it really difficult for those people who live along those routes to be able to get in and out as they need to. Um, they've all been quite and respectful, but just shown that concern that that does cause a huge backflow of traffic twice a day for them. And the buses will angle park so that way there's one lane left over for any emergency vehicles and need to get through there. Right. It won't we don't change Barkman southbound one way or anything. No, we're not changing any of that. <clears throat> it's all going to come in. Their bus is going to come in from off of 3rd Street, park in their angles, and then exit out 4th Street. Did we need to contact the city with anything with signage or? Already contacted uh, Andy. Um, this time he says we just need to let them know what we need. Peter. One thing, uh, this is the first I've seen what you're talking about here. One thing that I can see could be a problem is if you want to turn the buses off of that on the 4th Street there, uh, the size buses we have and everything, that could be a tight turn right there. We're going to have to make sure that people don't park on that one side on, of the street. On both sides of that street so, right. we can, so we can make our swing to get out of there. I think the longest bus is 70 feet. Is that right? Yes. And I may be getting down the weeds here a little bit instead of staging at the strategic level, but the buses, will they park at an angle pulling in with the lines or will they back in a contradictory line? No, they're just, they're just going to come in come in on off of 3rd Street on the Barkman and then just kind of angle. And yeah. then back in? No. Nope. At this point? They can just pull on out as they go. From well, a traffic well, crash perspective, and go ahead, Don. There will only be five to six buses there okay. at a time because we pick up at Riddle. And we're all we're picking up the we're picking up Columbia, and then they then they switch. And so we're only going to have so many. They'll just pull in. I can see from this picture they're going to pull in on an angle, so their door is going to be pretty close to the to the sidewalk and not too far away from it. There. That makes sense. I was looking at it from a crash perspective. Most of your backing or most of your crashes are from backing right. at your WalMarts and stuff. So I don't know if it's easier when you pull in somewhere to back in right as you've been driving. Just a thought. I'm sure you guys are on that. <coughs> And, I, and Wendy's already prepared a letter to go out at the end of this school year for returning students for next year about how that's going to work. Is that something, Ms. Vance, maybe we could incorporate at student sign up so parents have a map of that? I, you're never going to get everybody, I realize that, but if we make every avenue we can to Absolutely. let people know, we put on the website. Absolutely. We have website. website, and as part of the enrollment, we can have that listed that the students get on. There's, we're not going to do... Um, all of our enrollment will be done online, but we can most certainly put those announcement, announcements out and utilize our media resources, and, and it's a perfect time to, to start communicating that out and have all summer to do so. And it's going to be a lot like the parking lot issue at the high school. It's going to kind of have to be trial and error and show that there's still some things we need to tweak, but what we're really trying to do is to help eliminate those concerns, um, legitimate concerns from the neighbors in that area. And Hopefully that'll take a lot of the backlog off their street. There's a lot of pressure there from yeah, the is. two o'clock, one thirty on. Yeah. That's the way it is at Columbia. I it, think that this is a good opportunity too to like you shared about the high school and about Columbia to communicate that to our parents. That may maybe it's been a few years since we've communicated that so then they know what the what the plan is. Any questions for Officer Doherty? Good plan. Thank you.
Thank you, Skeeter, for the time you put into that. Is there a, and I'm sorry, Mr. Kessler, I forgot. Thank you for the time you put in the student policy revisions, too. I don't want to be remiss. <laughs> is there a motion to approve the riddle traffic flow? Is it? Do we need to approve that? I guess we do. It's a consent item. Yeah. Is there a motion to approve the riddle traffic flow pattern? So moved. Moved by Jenny. Second. Second by Tom. All in favor of approving the riddle traffic flow pattern, signify by raising your right hand. Motion carries six to zero. MJ Insurance Contract. MJ um, Insurance has been our uh, representative for the past several years now. I know that Dan, uh, even when I was in the buildings, um, we had MJ and Frank Crossland has been coming in. Done, he does a wonderful job of helping us run comparative costs in regards to our health insurance, um, eye insurance, dental insurance. RCTA has been part of those conversations. We actually have a meeting scheduled with him tomorrow. Again, trying to make sure we are doing what's best fiscally for the district and also for each and every one of our employees around the best insurance options. He's coming in tomorrow to look at the difference between self-insured, fully insured, um, other insurance plans that are out there. And so I would recommend that we continue this agreement. He does a lot of work with, especially with Brenda Troyer and making sure that we are constantly in compliance with all of the legislative act acts and everything else in regards to um, insurance and those things. It doesn't have anything specific about the cost of insurance moving forward. Those are discussions that are still going on, but this does retain them as our um, provider moving forward. My board knocks this one out, so I'm trying to pull it up. Here's a hard copy of it if you yeah, want. Right, that's right. It's there. <clears throat> right. Is that something we want to put publicly? I mean, that's something that we've paid in the past. Right. Um, we I pay would. per employee, it's $24 per month based on 196 employees. We don't have those specific numbers and employees in yet because we're not sure about next year. Minimum fee of 50000 if enrollment for the medical plan declines. The $24 fee per employee is payable in monthly installments with the first installment paid me immediately. This is something that has been part of the past contracts and it's also something that we're talking to Frank about tomorrow mm -hmm. because he knows and understands that um, should this, should we find better um, agreements out there that we will be moving in that direction. But okay, I'm confused. Better agreements as in going in with a different insurance? We are looking at the state insurance plan as well as a comparative. So we wouldn't, in that case, we would not use MJ because we, we would use them. MJ for dental and vision. <coughs> but then this cost would change. Okay. They're a consultant that they go pretty much like out to a marketplace and they get comparative costs for us. But it is these costs that, that we're trying to drill down and compare upon. Yes, because $24. That's what we've been paying for, I don't know how many years now. Yeah. Wow. What's that? Five or six years. Oh, yeah, at least. Any comments or questions for Janet or Mrs. Vance? So are there other competitors to MJ that, that come to our school and offer their services? We did that with RCTA about five or six years ago and they were at this level the best out there and cost comparative. He, Frank knows that we have a lot of concerns around the cost of insurance. As far as other competitors being able to meet that or beat that in regards to the $24 per employee, the only thing I know of that would change that would be looking at the state insurance policy that we are investigating tomorrow with him as a consultant. Has that improved from what it was when they first came out with the state policy because then it was we have reached out to other school districts. In fact, we met with um, a superintendent from uh, Whitco schools, and they have had a lot of good okay. feedback in regards to switching to the state policy. We, um, drilling down just to internally, it appears as if moving to the state insurance is going to cost us yet more than what this is and not provide as much. But the, again, those are the comparatives we're doing. It's just that necessary evil that we're looking into. The other thing is that you know, once you make that um, switch over to the state insurance that we've learned is that you were locked into yeah, it yeah, yeah. And, and you don't have the bargaining that we have uh, available to us through Frank and MJ. 
And so uh, our CTA has been in on every meeting, and Clint will be there tomorrow as we look at the difference between self-insured, fully insured, and do comparatives in regards to state insurance. So you feel that the cost paid to MJ is, at this point, worth the benefit that we receive from MJ? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sandy, is, Sandy and Tom were probably both part of those earlier discussions when they were looking at insurance providers and consultants. There's a variety of different insurance products. At one time we had a straight contract with the insurance company and mm -hmm. agents that took care of it. Uh, that, due to a variety of things, uh, the variety of things we had became very expensive. We looked at the two other processes. One would be through NJ, which is a, a, a self-funded program, what MJ does is what the insurance company front office does for us. They are the plan administrator, they pursue the claims, they fight the insurance company, they handle all that. Uh, but they're not the insurance, because mm -hmm. we're part of the insurance out <coughs> to the, the, uh, the, the capital. The third one is the trust kind of insurance, which is the state is, once you're in the area now. Each has its advantages, each has its disadvantages, but each of each one of them made that choice it was very good for the to write them. This was uh, a choice that was made by the board at a very difficult time when multiple, multiple times at a time when medical insurance rates were you know, forcing the creation of the Affordable Care Act. So they were going through all that at the same time. So I would urge a question. They were the best of the people we talked to at the time. And by the professional services, once you get them to the state. And, and we have, what we're bringing to you is not the recommendation for our insurance package moving forward. We'll know more information after tomorrow's meeting and, and continue with the negotiations with our CTA. But we're trying, we know that this is our hugest impact to general fund other than employees. It's part of that benefit. And, and we're really trying to minimize that to grow the general fund and to give back to the faculty and staff. But the options are um, minimal at best. So if I understand correctly, this is the fee paid to the consultants, and then there's a premium that we pay for the insurance that we buy separately mm -hmm. through them. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, because of the language of compensation, If we're going to go someplace else, you don't want to. Have well, that with the meeting tomorrow, that would, we have a month. Is there anything pressing the next month where we can't table it no. to get to uh, do our due diligence on that? No. Is there any objection to that? And it seems like in there, it as I read it, if it declines, so 195 would be declining, right? right. So I mean, if there's not much. There's not a grace. <clears throat> we will table that until next month then. Moving on, the Ivy Tech lease agreement. Um, I have been working with Gloria Carby in regards to the Ivy Tech portion of our building uh, located just on uh, the south side of us here. We are proposing entering another two-year lease agreement, which has been the standard lease agreement in the past, the um, payment to remain status quo. Um, it's been a wonderful opportunity for our students. Um, they have provided us hundreds of thousands of dollars um, of free credits for the students because we're part of that new tech association. Adam has done a wonderful job growing that relationship in regards to the number of courses that are offered and now the certification next year that we hope to offer. So I would encourage us to continue with this relationship and renew that lease agreement for the next two years. Is the size, the amount payable, so you said a status quo, the size that they're using is the is Correct. status quo? Correct. Everything would remain as is. And it's been a really good working relationship. There are times when we need to utilize some of their classrooms, and if they're not in use, they allow us to move over into there for the overflow with no additional charges or, or reimbursements, those types of things. It's been a really good ongoing working relationship. And not including, here's what you just said. We've received a lot of free credits from Ivy Tech. Hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of free credits.
Any questions or comments for Janet? Is there a motion to approve the Ivy Tech lease agreement? I move to approve the Ivy Tech lease agreement. Moved by Steve. Second. Second by Sandy. All in favor of approving the lease agreement? Or signify by raising your right hand. The motion carries six to zero. Asphalt bids. We were waiting on the asphalt bids that Val will take you through. We wanted to make sure that we understood exactly that we would have the approval for the markings of the riddle traffic flows that played into the bid process. So, so on these um, slides that or bids that we had received on it, um, uh, we're on a rotation to get um, our parking lots really yearly surfaced, and this year. Um, both Columbia and Riddle are up on, uh, as well as the Learning Center are up on uh, rotation this year. So um, we had two bids that we received um, um, quotes for, and um, those are included as well. Um, the recommendation is for um, DC seal coating is um, is what our maintenance uh, department has recommended they not only came in a little bit less but um, they also have um, a yearly report established as well where they are familiar with um, the working operations of what's expected and the quality that's expected as well but I did appreciate the fact that there was um, additional interest and, and intent that was um, that was really super so how is Columbia going to work with the construction this summer. We've talked to them in regards to that, and it shouldn't interfere with where they're moving the larger equipment in and out of the. I'll verify that with them, um, and that will be one of the last. That, they that was one of actually. It was um, included in with the bid spec that was advertised and, and mailed um, to quite a few even local um, companies that do this type of work. It was communicated of hey, you know, we we are going to have um, construction going on. And, um, and wanted to A, communicate that, as well as B, understand what that collaborative effort would look like and, and how that would represent. And that even the construction crew said, hey, that's no problem. You know, we can, you know, coordinate, work around, and, and it seemed to be a nominal issue. Well, there's one, the one quote has a total of all three together, and I didn't do the math, and I could yep, have, in fact, it's my fault. What is the total of the... I've slept since I've looked at it up first. I mean, I'm here. Because I just saw the first one, I thought, why the difference? And I realized it was just one building. So sure. for the public and... Yep, I'm working on it. So I know the... One so the DC seal coating altogether is $18,610. As opposed to... As opposed to the Q and L seal coating at 22915 okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're Johnny on the spot. I, was, I had my calculator there. And we're comparing apples to apples there. What it looked like to me, because it went out as a spec for the bids, I assume. Yep, yep, it did. At some point, um, we're going to need to start talking about replacing um, the baseline. Um, we can only seal for so many years, and then before too long, all there is is cracks for everything to just drip into. So, and it, the so our top layer, coat layer on it, quite a few of our parking lots are going to need to be resurfaced and milled down and restuck reset. So. We ran into that the with the high school. Is, yeah, the high school would be the largest concern at this point and we're putting that on the on the plans for capital projects, but the last time they were here there was a lot of concern around continuing down the road that we were going and just re asphalting it that something more had to be done. Okay. Well we have bring uh, that up. Brad and Jim oversee it. Yes mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Because there's several steps here to make sure it's all being there. Absolutely. They actually did a really good job of putting those specs together and they needed it to me for a review and then from there we advertised out. So. I know the last time we had the high school done, there were a lot of questions because there was stuff that should have probably been done then that wasn't. And that's just so because maybe it just wasn't. There was, the was follow-up that was done because I was yeah. even out there too of... Of yeah. concerns over sealing on when we've got a storm you know coming in and yeah. stuff unfortunately that storm missed us but um, even that th those concerns were addressed of the quality and it's, it's literally just there's not a base for much to adhere to on the, on the top right. layer so it goes down to the bottom when layer. that happened from the newer board members when that happened I asked the highway department to come in and mm -hmm. walk that with us and at that time 
they even shared that it was the best that they could do with what they had as a foundation out there, um, that it was just getting to the point where we're gonna have to tear that all up and put a, put a new foundation in for it. But we were concerned that before we released mm -hmm. payment, we did have the highway department come in and they verified it was the best that could be done under the circumstances. It's been there a few years. It has, and it takes a lot of traffic. There's a lot that goes on. It's still the new high school, so. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty new yet. <laughs> Are there any questions for Jana about the asphalt bids? Or for Val? So you should say. Comments? Is there a motion? to accept the DC seal coating asphalt bid, is that correct? Is there a motion to accept that bid? I move to accept the bid from DC seal coating. Motion made by Steve. Second. Second by Tom, he beat you to it. All in favor approving DC seal coating to do the asphalt at Columbia, Riddle, and the Learning Center? Mm -hmm. Signify by raising your right hand. Motion carry, or okay, all opposed? Ice habit five to one. <coughs> LED project and next steps. And, uh, right now, I'm just seeking, I believe, permission to continue forward. We are looking at um, trying to alleviate some of the pressures on both capital projects as well as the general fund. And one of the ways to do that is through better um, LED lighting. We're also uh, trying to look into the idea around solar energy at Riddle. We have Terry Thornsbury right now trying to draw up um, specs for the LED throughout the district and breaking that up by building as well so that we know where we would be in regards to cost and return on the investment. So I'm asking for permission to continue to work with Terry Thornsbury around that and once those come in with his estimates of what it would be, whether or not we need to go through the bid process or the quote process. And, and moving forward, we want to keep these as locally as we can um, and, and work with the community in regards to that. Val and I continue to work on um, uh, making sure that the funds are there around that and we'll bring more information to you. But right now I'm just seeking uh, permission to continue to work with Terry to have those specs available to us and then be able to return those, get that out to the community as we work with the community in regards to funding around this. And the reason behind that is it can save us a lot of money energy-wise. Absolutely. So we're not necessarily approving the LED project because we're doing further information into it exactly. for the next steps. But just working on it. Actually, what we're looking for you to do is to approve the administration taking bids if necessary before the next meeting so that they can bring the bids to you for opening up the next meeting. If the matter can come in under quote requirement, allowing them to go ahead and open the quotes and then bring the quotes to you for action. So, uh, Terry Thornsbury will come with a recommendation and a number. And that number may be 120 or maybe 160. We don't know yet. When he comes to you with that number, uh, or comes to the administration with that number between this meeting and the next meeting, they will know that they have to bid it out, send out the specification for the share will prepare for them. Then they have to publish it twice, the second time, at least ten, uh, at least seven mm -hmm. days before the board meeting. And so that means they've got to start in the next ten days or else they can't get it all done. Um, but they don't want to have you meet again to authorize them to go forward. If they come back with uh, an estimate of 120 or 140, then they can simply uh, ask not, one, not fewer than three people known to deal in the product to provide information uh, to provide a quote to the school corporation and we don't bring those to you at the next meeting. So the motion, is there a motion to take the next steps and allow Terry Thornsbury or the administration to decide whether to receive bids or quotes? Is that the motion I'm asking uh, for? The motion is to allow the administration to uh, publish for quotes if required. And bring Proposes to the 
I wrote it down, Ted, and I'm still probably going to ask you. Is there a motion to allow the administration, administration to publish for quotes if required and for them to bring that proposal to us before the next meeting? So moved. Moved Second. by Tom. Second by, I, so I saw her hand first, Sandy, so That's I'll give fine. it. Fine. All in favor of approving that motion <laughs> signified by raising your right hand. Motion carries six to zero. Number 11, sale of salvage items and outbuildings located at 230 West 18th Street, as well as surplus equipment. Absolutely. We are getting ready to have the auction on June 8th. Um, the board approved that in the prior uh, meeting in regards to John Garrett and, and uh, moving forward with that. We did have them in. I also reached out to um, Jim and to Brad, as well as to all of the principals. While we have an auctioneer here and on site, any of those other ticket items that we want to put in for the auction um, to to uh, help clear out room for space and storage as well as to recap any funds that we might be able to. So those are the surplus items that you're seeing listed there. Um, the one interesting thing may be the two basketball goals that were original to the gym. The new but school. There, but there may be, some, may be somebody with <laughs> some sentimental interest in those as well, but just asking for permission. Um, they did come and take pictures of the interior of the home. That was just last week um, for those who are interested in salvaging as well as those who may be interested in using materials to refurbish the home. Um, but we are gearing up for that open house and that auction then. So are we selling the outbuildings themselves too? We are. Okay. Selling plots of grass. Well, <laughs> Mr. Garrett said he would sell anything he could. So he said, you know, we're we're going to do as Straight much as we can side. to get to get that money back before we end up um, tearing it down. And then is June first? I saw on the sign. June first would be the open house for the for anybody to come in and look at the items that. Um, are available and to go through the home and to see the interior and the woodworking and the chandeliers and those types of things. And then the auction will be held on June 8th in the evening. Okay, now who's going to take? I mean, if somebody comes in there and buys the, the woodwork or the staircase, or who takes it then? They do, I think. It becomes their property. And that's what we'll talk a little bit about. If, if this is approved, then that brings us to the next item. That we'll, no, you, because we have those thoughts as well. Mm -hmm. Any questions or comments for Jane on that? Is there a motion to approve the sale of salvage items and outbuildings located at 230 West 18th Street as well as the surplus equipment? So moved. Moved by Steve. Second. Second by Sandy. All in favor of approving that sale, signify by raising your right hand. Motion carries six to zero. Once again, June 1st for open house. June 1st in the afternoon for open house, and the auction will be on the 8th. I just want to say it twice, so the Sentinel and RTV. Absolutely, and we'll continue to advertise it, and they've already got it out on their sites as well, the auction here does. Okay, then since that was approved, the approval, the next one would be the approval of the proposed specifications for the demolition of the structure at the same address. Correct, and I've had conversations with Ted in regards to this. The concern is once we have the auction, um, the auctioneer suggested that we give a 10-day period for the buyers to come in and to remove the items from the home, knowing that a lot of the items will be taken yet that evening because um, that's typically how those in the salvage business work. But after that, when he is selling windows and doors and those types of things, then we have a structure that could become a potential concern liability there on the property. So we are asking for um, approval of the proposed specifications um, trying to work within the timeline in regards to the auction being on June 8th. The auctioneer stated that the, uh, the norm is to give those purchasers 10 days to remove the items. Um, we have a board meeting then on June 19th. If we are able to put out the proposed specifications with your approval now, we could bring those bids back to you on the June 19th date and be ready. Uh, part of the specs is to have the teardown started um, and I believe that we set that date on June 26th, yes. is that correct? Yes. To start the tear down so we don't have that empty structure that is now without windows, doors, those types of things standing. So we need to try to get that out and get those bids going so that we can have the demolition of the home at that point in time. Well, we have somebody there when the salvage people take their things out. 
uh, well, we talked a little bit about that because that is a concern. Um, we, uh, standard practice, my understanding is once they bid on it, it becomes their personal items and that we make sure that the home is open between certain hours and we will most certainly utilize Skeeter and others just to do drive-bys and stuff, but essentially that becomes their personal possession and we'll do the best that we can to, to help monitor that, but would not assume full responsibility for it once it's sold. Does the home have a basement? It does. Does number one include the basement? And it says all materials associated with structure. Yes. Okay. Because it could just knock the walls in cover. Mm -hmm. Do we need to change that? It does have a full basement. It does. Um, and, well, let's see. Well, and that's where number two came into play for leveling a ground that the home is located on because not only will this include the removal of the structure, which I was my intent when I um, was working on this was all materials associated with the structure would cover the cinder blocks that comprise of the basement. So removal of those cinder blocks um, as well as, um, you know, get us the right fill that we need to um, to fill in the basement to, to have a level, a level surface, a level ground once those materials are removed. As long, long as that's understood, because you could knock the walls in and still get 18 and inches of fill above it. I've not written a bit book like this before, so I am open to suggestions yeah, and, right. and comments and insights. So um, if... Maybe just add that more basement well, I foundation. Tom, I, would, I read the first paragraph, we'll carry on the removal of home and all material associated with structure, means you can't Shove your crap in the basement. Okay, that's why I was asking does all materials associated with structure include right. basement? Yeah. Well, it, it includes all materials and then mm -hmm. it includes the, the foundation down to 18 inches of the ground. You can build around that, but it would not necessarily include the removal of all of the basement. Oh, would it? If you're making these, it. Well, yeah. if you build in the future, somebody's right. going to have to deal with that because that'll be down there. So, so rather than to 18 work with inches, to remove the basement as well. Yeah, call for removal of the basement walls and flooring and mm -hmm. Oh, concrete it's a full floor. concrete it basement slab. Mm -hmm. slab. They used to do training burns at the fire department, but I don't know if they do that anymore either. No, I, I've got an old farmhouse, and I asked Tom Butler about you want to come out and burn it down? Yeah. We can't do that anymore. Well, I didn't, yeah, I didn't know because. Uh, apply the state, check for asbestos. Less everything on the atmosphere. I get that. He said, go ahead and burn yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that because I was thinking for our SWAT teams to do that stuff too, these old houses. So I'm not sure a month after we get the city to create the burn ban. But we right. <laughs> <laughs> Probably too soon. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe just a little. I guess it is in town too. So, so yeah. if we work with Ted around the language, Ted and Rachel around the language for the basement as well. Unlike mm -hmm. Tom, I feel more comfortable okay. with the bait because somebody's going to have to deal with it. It's going to be us in the future anyway. So yeah, if you're going to build there in the future, you're going to deal with it because you can cover it up and it'll look nice. Well, but if you have to put a foundation for a new building, you're going to be in it. Right. Well, and that's where I was under the impression of well, removal of home and all materials associated, yeah. and that's the. Yeah. Foundation that's why I that. asked if that included the basement. I took it as yes, but then when you get to number two, like you said, it only goes 18 inches down under. So um, I can, or is so would the suggestion be to um, remove the to a depth of 18 inches below grade and just leave it as leveling of ground that home is located on? Like once all of the materials in the home are removed, or I'm sorry, once the home and all materials associated with it for number one, once you get the home off and all materials associated with it, meaning the cinder blocks and the basement concrete, once that's removed, then level the ground that the home, I should say, was located on. I, like I said, Ted, you work with, or you can work with Ted on okay. that. But yeah, we, yeah. Okay. we'll be specific. We want to tear basement walls and floor. We'll say tear out basement walls and floor. We'll it all off. Bring in fresh builder. And the question is, how far do you want them to go? How far, how deep down does your footer go? Three feet? How far down? The basement is it? wall, it's it's probably about eighteen inches, and the, at, you know, because that's already six feet below ground. Right. So, but when you say um, level ground eighteen inches below grade, so that means it's going to be a, a hole eighteen inches deep. 
Because right. grade is ground level. So you don't want to be below grade. That was a suggestion added in, so we can change and update to to have you know. So at the end result, the spec says take everything out of the basement and level it to where level we need to be. Off. Exactly. Right. So we can level. update that accordingly. Otherwise, Absolutely. we're going to have a pond. Yeah. <sighs> a pool. Pond or pool. Oh, no. Pond or pool. Pond's good for me. <laughs> Any other comments or suggestions for the bid specifications? Yes, sir. Let's let's say somebody bought a window and got hurt taking it out. Is the structure actually covered by the corporation insurance right now? Yes. Mm -hmm. It is. Until it's gone. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about a large commercial policy is as you buy and sell things, it's automatically included. Any other questions? <clears throat> So I guess our motion for this, and please interject here, accept the proposed spe approval of the pro approved proposed specifications for the demolition of the structure at 230 West 18th Street with the addendum or suggestions made by you and uh, Rachel. Is there is there a motion for that? So moved. <laughs> I second that. Motion by second. It's by Sandy. Boy, I'm losing it now. We're going too. We're going too long. <laughs> Motion by Sandy, second by Steve. All in favor of approving that? The proposed specifications. Please signify by raising your right hand. I've already voted three times. Motion carried six to zero. Yeah, then we'll bring those back to you on the 19th. Okay, okay. perfect. Uh, faculty and staff focus. The personnel report. Come on, board docs. Don't fail me now. Um, it's you, hiring Donald W. Myers, a bus route driver. Brett Heisey is a temporary seventh grade middle school math teacher for Lori Shane for the month of May, starting May 3rd this year. Lauren Mitchell is a Columbia permanent sub for Ryan Helt as he transfers to RMS. And Don King as the director of transportation. Russell Dugan mm -hmm. as the high school night custodian. Lauren Mitchell as the substitute for Megan Gunwer's maternity leave, second grade, starting August of 2017 through January 29, 2018 at the earliest. Samantha Butler is the Columbia School Nurse. Family Medical Leave, Pam Brower, Riddle, fourth grade, <clears throat> April 1st through August 1st, 2017. Maternity leave, Stephanie Brown, middle eighth grade math. Uh, estimated due date is June 1st, 2017, so 12 weeks from that date, but that we know is not going to be probably right on the day. <laughs> I'm sure she's hoping it is. But. Uh, resignations, Julia Newcomer, speech-language pathologist for middle and high school, effective at the end of the 2016-2017 school year. Becky Burke, the high school physics and integrated chemistry and physics teacher, effective May 30th of this year. Michelle Wallace, Columbia preschool instructional assistant, effective May 30th of this year. Susan Olmstead, Columbia Food Service Assistant, effective May 17, 2017. Terminations. Heaven Espinoza, High School Intense Needs Instructional Assistant Life Skills Classroom, effective April 19, 2017. Corey Pruitt, High School Instructional Assistant Special Needs, effective May 9, 2017. And Mark Turnpaul, Middle School Building Tech, effective May 17, 2017. For enrichments. Spring Enrichment, Kylie Dagg, Columbia Zoo Enrichment, mm -hmm. Megan Gongwer, Columbia Zoo Enrichment, Bethany Sewell, Columbia Zoo Enrichment, and Chris Cox, Middle School Sky Zone Enrichment Trip. For Summer Intercession, Deb Wolford, High School Mathematics, Felix Amandi, High School English, Bethany Sewell, Columbia, first grade, Amy Banks, Columbia, second grade, Kylie Dagg, Columbia, kindergarten, Michelle Walters, Columbia, IA, Leslie Strim for Riddle, Mona Zion for Riddle, Megan McLaughlin for Riddle, Tracy Monocle for Riddle Instructional Assistant, Summer High School, Tony Stasiak for Government, Trevor Brown for English, Justin Pearson for SAE, Joel Lowe for Cabinet Making, Health, Katie Felke and Amy Blackburn, PE, Brian Hooker, Algebra, Lori Williams and Deb Wolford for two weeks, and Felix Amandi for two weeks. For Columbia Summer Reading Program Coordinator, Lauren Atkinson. For Columbia Summer Reading 
program, Amy Banks. Columbia? Okay. Let's make sure I had it right. Well, the, the summer readings program was something that we used to do, do the, through the Duke um, energy grant monies that we spoke about. It was such a beneficial program that we, um, I believe I shared with the board just a few months ago, that if we continue to keep that reading program and, and maintain the integrity of the program, but tried to lessen the amount that we spent mm -hmm. in regards to the grant. So that is why we try to bring somebody with their administrative license, and we need to congratulate Lori. She's just now completing her administrative license. Have you taken your test? You have. You have? Still waiting on the results? I have. You could, good Congratulations. You. So trying to grow um, administrators internally, so she's taking on that reading program. But because the Duke Energy Grant at one time had certain restrictions about the age levels that we could teach, now that we're going to house that on our own, we have more flexibility in the students that we are going to service in regards to that. So that's why you're going to see some different names, trying to track it by reading abilities and include more students across the district that need it rather than being confined to the restrictions of the grant. So is it all going to be K through 2 students? Or I see some riddle teachers on there, so is it going to be some riddle students? It's just kindergarten, first and second grade students okay. that just finished. So we do have, we just met today, and we do have a group of those higher kids that are going into third grade that are going to do some I-read practice, but it is kindergarten, first, second grade students. As of today, we have 65 kids signed up. Lori has her budget. She came to um, Jason and myself last week and said it can't be done. <laughs> so Lori... <laughs> Welcome to administration. This is what you have to work with. So she's been having those meetings, and I trust that they're going well, and she'll stay within that budget. I'm just I'm used to Lori Agus and RMS, not sure, I, sure. keep my. Yeah. You know, trying to grow other administrators here in the district. Sure. Uh, following up with Lori Agus Columbia Summer Reading Program Coordinator, Columbia Summer Reading Program, Amy Banks, Kylie Dagg, Sally Dunwoody, Amy Freeman, Bethany Sewell. Leslie Strim, Sarah Dalton, and for the iRead-3 program, Mona Zion and Megan Schroeder. And then there is another sheet, I don't know. Ah, here we go. Uh, sports resignation, Carmen Reeves, the jumping coach, the assistant coach for boys and girls varsity track team. I had a question on Stephanie's maternity leave. Is that, since she's due at the end of the school year, is that 12 weeks after the baby is born, or is that the first 12 weeks of the school year? Stephanie is guaranteed to have her baby Thursday at this point. But my question is, <laughs> and I understand it's red day. It, is, that, is her maternity leave, is she taking it from that point for 12 weeks, or the first 12 weeks of next school year? I believe she's planning to return in August. Okay, so 12 weeks after the baby is born. It was all going to be dependent. Well, let's make it easy for her. Why don't we just say, after Mr. Hawes finds out, unless you have an issue with that, no, or the board has well, an objection? No, no not an objection. At all. It's just confused the way. Sure, it is. I understand. Maybe we can't do that, but we are in the people business, so can we do that? Well, <laughs> how's that? Perfect. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. Is there a motion on that note? Is there a motion to approve the personnel report as given? Uh, Jenny? Yeah. Jenny made the motion to approve Second. it. Second by Sandy. All in favor of approving the personnel report signify by raising your right hand. <coughs> motion carries six to zero. Brad, may I mention one thing before we move sure. on to the personnel report? Mm -hmm. um, she was not part of our retirement. Yes. tonight because um, she this is her second retirement from us but I wanted to give Mrs. Newcomer more than than just reading her name right there because what an asset she has been to our corporation and um, our lives would not be the same without her so I really appreciate her she's phenomenal she's not her but I hear but I've heard nothing but positive Absolutely. things about her so I'd like to congratulate her on her second retirement yes well deserved and maybe sure. she'll come back <laughs> I think she may get a damn McCarthy bumper sticker. <laughs> I mean, Ron's still working, so yeah. maybe she'll just decide that she wants to come back. And if, if we could, I would like for Don King to take this opportunity to introduce himself and just give just a few moments. He's waited patiently back there, and 
I told him this is an exception to our board meetings, but Don, if you'd like to stand and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your. I'm Don King. Uh, I want to tell you, appreciate the opportunity to come to Rochester and serve up here in, in the capacity of transportation director. I've been affiliated with Gaston Schools for 30 for 21 years down there, working there. Uh, this is quite a move for me. I've been in the bus department down there as well as the maintenance and doing lawn care and the sports fields and everything. So I'm happy to get in this part of it up here and be head of the transportation and work with the buses and the drivers and, and the skier and the, anything concerning transportation. So I'm quite excited about it. I've got one weekend. I came back for week number two. <laughs> Today was a good day also. So uh, I've been very, very well received up here. I've been coaching uh, girls basketball in the eighth grade level up here for 12 years, as well as driving buses for uh, subbing routes and extracurricular activities. So I know several of you people sitting in here, and I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my wife is Ellen King. She coaches cheerleaders at Caston. Uh, we've been married for 44 years this fall, and uh, she's very supportive of me taking this move at this time in our lives, and, and we thought it was a great idea, a great move for us. We have one son, Jeff. He's 39 years old, and he said, Dad, it's the best thing you've done except when you married Mom. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, I, I, I didn't have any problems with casting or anything down there. This opportunity presented itself, and I thought it was a move I wanted to make, and I'm very excited about being here with the folks in Rochester. Well, Don and Ellen, welcome to Rochester. Thank you. Bless his heart. He went through two, three, two and a half rounds of interviews. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Several okay, different committees. The maintenance out of it, he wanted the leaf blower today to take care of the back here. Out of the transportation. <laughs> <laughs> Working. He's snow day since. <laughs> <laughs> we get a snow day now. <laughs> and I know he's working diligently. We have inspections coming up just in another week. Inspections we are June 1st and June 2nd. And so working diligently with the drivers to, to get those buses ready. State police guys are hard, I know, Don. <laughs> I know the guys are coming pretty well, so I've been around in the, at Cassin for a long time, so I think we'll be, we'll be okay. I'm sure you will. Superintendent's business. Just a reminder to board members that this Wednesday um, we are serving uh, breakfast to all of the buildings, so um, I know that they are anxious to come out and, and be with the faculty and staff in each of the buildings. Um, next Correct me if I'm wrong, Adam. Next Tuesday, a week from tomorrow, will be the senior breakfast. Yes. Board members are welcome to attend that. It starts at 7 in the morning. Correct. Um, so please feel free to come out and see that. And then we have graduation rehearsals after that. So that's kind of a bittersweet and fun time while they're trying to capture all that energy and, and get them organized to get through the ceremony. Um, June 2nd is graduation. And then I had made a note as well to reiterate the open house of the property on June 1st and the auction on June 8th. I believe that's all I have. What time should we be there on Wednesday morning? Wednesday morning PD starts at 7.30 in the morning. 7.30. Mm -hmm. Is there any public com Go ahead. Hopefully I won't be the only one there this week. <laughs> Sandy showed up last week. Wrong Wednesday. <laughs> good heart, good intentions, wrong day. But they didn't beat me. <laughs> so, Ms. Vance, so usually before the graduation, we have a study session, and we won't do that this time. So we're just going to show up and wing it? No, I have actually <laughs> spoken with Brad and need to send out. I'm trying. We are hoping to have um, a board meeting possibly this Friday. Um, we'll send that out in regards to insurance um, the, com the competitive bids around insurance we'll have some personnel that we need to take care of in regards to changes to um, summer school that we need to make and hopefully to talk about those things but I'll send out a doodle um, with with possible okay. dates and times and we could even Val and I will look at the schedule look at Friday afternoon and possibly I don't know if Tuesday will be too late we were seeking those competitive bids and our um, Insurance contract rules over on June 1st. Okay, thank you. This Friday or next Tuesday? This, we're looking at meeting this Friday if we can. We'd still have time to post it on Wednesday. I'm hoping for next Tuesday, but I understand you want next Friday, so well, that's why you're the superintendent. Is there any public comment? <clears throat> any questions, comments from the board? Is there any further business to discuss? In that case, we'll consider the meeting adjourned.